Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Nancy Alexander with the Heinrich Boll Foundation, and um, the Heinrich Boll Foundation is um, co-sponsoring a day with Earth Action, and this particular uh, session is being sponsored by the Forum on Democracy and Trade, the Center for Economic and Policy Research, and um, Citizens Trade Campaign. And it asks um, basically about what the prospects for change are in Obama's international economic diplomacy. And it asks some pretty key questions. Has the current economic crisis impacted how developing countries think about finance and trade? If the current crisis was partly triggered by radical financial deregulation and the shrinking of national policy space through new trade commitments, why are world leaders intent on signing more agreements and finishing the Doha round of World Trade Organization talks? What are the implications of a massive recapitalization of the International Monetary Fund? For those of you that um, review the outcome of the London summit in April. The London summit, which was comprised of the group of 20 countries and um, several others in addition to the 20, the London summit stipulated that uh, the IMF's resources should be almost tripled. And so, some of the events today have been asking the question, should uh, the IMF get this massive recapitalization without, at the same time, or before getting this recapitalization, having a more democratic governance structure, greater transparency, greater accountability. Um, the, the session also asks, what are the prospects for countries in Latin America to pursue alternatives to the IMF and free trade agreement policies? And uh, our keynote presentation uh, by Mark Weisbrot, who I'll introduce in a minute, is going to be followed by a panel where we'll have an opportunity to delve even more deeply into these kinds of questions. And, um, you know, a lot of you have been around for uh, a long time and really don't need basic <coughs> reminders about, you know, what powers these institutions have. Um, and there's been a lot of conversation today about the International Monetary Fund. And I just want to say one thing, and Mark may enlarge on this in his presentation, that people should remember when we discuss the IMF, and that is that it is head of a financial cartel. And what does that mean? That means that when a country is not in compliance with the targets that the IMF sets for it with respect to fiscal deficits, inflations, um, inflation, monetary policy, and so on, then it is, in the language of the fund, that country is off track. Now, what does off track mean? Off track means that the IMF is basically giving a black mark to the, to the country. And when that happens, a whole sequence of events happens. And that is that not only government donors who are very critical to especially the poor, uh, poor countries, two-thirds of all the official development assistance that's received by poor countries is in the form of official development assistance that comes from governments, uh, especially European governments, but also U.S. Agency for International Development, as well as the concessional arms of both the IMF and the World Bank. 
protection alarm is the Poverty Reduction and Growth Facility. It was renamed with these words poverty in it. Um, and the World Bank's uh, concessional facility is called the International Development Association. So low-income countries are extremely dependent upon the rating that they get from the IMF. Middle-income countries that had uh, had access or have usually had access to uh, world markets, if they get a, a bad grade, then private finance withdraws from their countries. And so basically, this is a financial cartel. And so when people talk about the conditions of the IMF, they're referring to conditions that must be met for money to flow. So since we've said a lot about the IMF, that's a basic, and um, Mark will give us a much deeper and broader picture. And uh, Mark has received his PhD in economics from the University of Michigan. He is co-author with Dean Baker of Social Security, The Phony Crisis, and has written numerous research papers on economic policy. He writes a column on economic and policy issues that's distributed to over 550 newspapers by the McClatchy Tribune Information Services. His opinion pieces have appeared in the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, the Boston Globe, and most major newspapers. And I especially want to commend to you um, the wide swath of papers that uh, the Center for Economic and Policy Research have um, displayed on the table outside and draw your attention to one, empowering the IMF should reform be a requirement for increasing the, the fund's resources. Another, IMF voting shares, no plans for significant changes, and um, many others that are deserving of your, your attention. And, uh, with that, I turn you over to Mark, who is co-director of the center, and he'll be speaking on the global economic crisis and its implications for developing countries. There could be no better person to hear this story from. I give you Mark. Thanks, Nancy, for the kind um, introduction. I thought I was going to have to wait till I was dead to hear anybody say anything that nice about me. Uh, <laughs> and Nancy herself is uh, one of the leading experts on these institutions in this town and has been waging a valiant struggle for reform for at least the last decade that I can remember. And so I'm very thankful to her and to uh, Peter Williams and the Forum of Democracy and Trade and everybody who helped. Uh, organize this event and a series of events. So uh, I was asked to give a, uh, an overview, a little bit of an overview of the, uh, the global economic recession and, uh, and its effect on developing countries, and then something about the IMF and what has to do with that. And I don't know what everybody's discussed uh, previously, so I'll, I'll try not to overlap too much, but there will be questions lots of time for lots of time for for you to follow up on any uh, details. And of course, uh, more details uh, can be found on our website at uh, cebr.net. So in terms of the, uh, the over overview, uh, there's a short term and a long term uh, story. And so I'll try and do a little bit of, of both. Uh, in the long term story that the crisis is, is or the recession is part of, is a long-term uh, development failure in, in the world, in the vast majority of countries in the world. Uh, you've seen a, over the last uh, almost 30 years now, uh, in the vast majority of countries, you've seen a sharp a slowdown in, in economic growth. And uh, you've seen that um, also Going along with that, you have a reduction in progress, in the rate of progress um, on social indicators such as infant and child mortality, uh, education, life expectancy. Now again, uh, this is 
this is adjusting for the fact that you can't see the same rate of progress over time. There's something called diminishing returns, for example, with life expectancy. Uh, you know, it's not as easy to go from a life expectancy of 70 to 75 in your country uh, as it is to go from uh, you know, 50 to 55. But if you adjust for that and you look at the last uh, three decades, and again, you look at all the social indicators for which we have data, and you look at the rate of economic growth and just the diminishing returns there as well, you find there's been a drastic uh, slowdown. That's a long-term economic uh, failure. And again, it's not uh, all the countries in the world. There are a few exceptions, and they're big ones, you know, uh, like China and India. They contain a lot of people. But the relevant variable here is the number of countries, right? Because if you have an, you have basically an experiment over the last 30 years, where a whole set of new uh, policies were tried, and they were tried in you know 80 to 100 countries, to varying degrees, and a handful of them did better, just uh, very few. Uh, I mean, a literal handful, and uh, and the rest did vastly worse. And uh, you can, uh, if you look at the countries like China or India or Vietnam or Korea that actually are the exception you find that they were the ones that did not implement uh, the policies that the policy changes that most of the rest of the world did. And those are uh, problems that we, they're generally referred to in the rest of the world as policy changes as neoliberal policies. And uh, you know, I don't have time to go through them all, but you know, basically they have to do with the uh, opening up of deregulation of uh, international financial flows, the uh, opening up indiscriminate opening up of trade, the uh, narrowing of policy space that other people have uh, talked about, in other words, the basic abandonment of development strategies that have been successful in the past, some unsuccessful, but mostly successful ones have been uh, abandoned, um, and uh, privatizations and uh, a lot of uh, labor market reforms as well, which affect the distribution too. So that's the context. And I'm only uh, giving you this context for in, in one minute quickly because what this uh, particular recession is, this recession is, is related to those reforms, only it started uh, unlike the others, uh, other uh, crises that we've had in recent decades. This one, uh, there are many financial crises, currency crises, but this one started in the, in the rich countries and particularly in the United States is the epicenter of this one. So this one was different. But I would argue that it's still part of the overall pattern of, of neoliberal changes. OK, that said, now we go to the short-term story. And we maybe come back to the long-term as there is interest, uh, long-term uh, policy changes. So the short-term story is, first, uh, that the reason I use the word world recession instead of financial crisis, well, the word crisis is kind of overused. Uh, to me, a crisis is like, you know, what you had in Argentina in 2001, the five presidents resigned within a few weeks, you know. Um, you know, so in a lot of ways, this isn't a crisis. Uh, uh, I think it's a little bit overused um, because, it, you know, um, we could be in this recession for years and Obama might even get reelected in 2012, you know, even if everything is still messed up. He might not, but he might. So. Uh, I would call it a severe recession, and it's a global recession. And that's not to trivialize it. It's the worst recession, as everybody knows, since the Great Depression. But more importantly, I'm not using the word financial crisis because I don't think it's primarily financial. I and mean, we've written about this quite a bit at Secret. In fact, the overall, uh, the overwhelming aspect of this uh, recession is, is the real economy. That is, the declines you're looking around uh, see, you see in the United States, but also in most of the world, are overwhelmingly due uh, to uh, a decline in the real economy. So let me start just briefly with the US to show that. The US is uh, nearly a quarter of the world's economy, and so it affects the other countries. So if Mexico, for example, is going to have, projected to have a uh, decline of 7.3% this year, which is huge, and one of the biggest, bigger ones in the and certainly in this hemisphere, it's because they're dependent primarily, uh, overwhelmingly, on trade with the United States. You know, around 80%, 75% of their trade is with the United States. 
and, uh, and trade is a, a large part of their economy, maybe 37% of their economy. On, on that basis, they're having a huge decline. It really doesn't have all that much to do with the financial system, even in Mexico, and, and much less in the United States itself, which is the cause of the Mexican uh, slowdown. So I, I want to emphasize that, that it's widely misunderstood. Almost everything I read in the media is about the financial uh, crisis. And that really is a, a, a not very accurate, uh, I would say an inaccurate uh, description for what, uh, what has happened. So in the United States, the, the, the epicenter of the storm, the main cause of this uh, recession, our recession, uh, is the bursting of an $8 trillion housing bubble. And uh, that peaked in 2006. And it was quite obvious. And we began, my colleague Dean Baker began writing about it in 2002. And it should have been obvious uh, to a lot of people. In fact, he was still writing about all the people who should be fired uh, for not having noticed the biggest asset bubble in the history of the world. And uh, that would include some people at the IMF as well, but also the Federal Reserve and everywhere else. And uh, so that was the main uh, cause. And this, again, you don't see uh, the word bubble very much in the press. But you could abstract out all the problems in the financial system. In other words, say that they were all solved tomorrow. Uh, all the, the toxic assets uh, and everything else. And you would not be facing a drastically different situation in the United States. Because the first thing that bubble has a wealth effect, what the economy is called wealth effect, and that is people cut back on their spending. And the construction center, which reached about 6.5% of GDP at its peak, and goes down to 2.7 or so now, that is also another huge uh, shock to the economy. And so those shocks combined with other housing related sectors would be enough to give us the worst recession since the Great Depression, without any uh, problems in the financial system, uh, secondary problems uh, whatsoever. Now, that's not to say that the deregulation didn't make it worse and all the subprime mortgages and, and everything else. But again, this is primary. The other stuff is big or sizable, but secondary, uh, very secondary. And that's very important to uh, understand. And there's a million ways I can show you that, but I hope you'll take it at face value and ask questions if you want. I don't want to spend the whole time on that. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means that the, the biggest impact on the rest of the world is also through the, uh, most of the rest of the world is through the real economy, which is trade. So Japan, for example, is going to decline 6%, uh, projected decline is 6% this year, after a 0.7% uh, decline in the last year. That's because of trade, heavily dependent on trade. Um, Europe is going to do worse than uh, the United States. The projection for the United States uh, after 1.1% growth last year is 2.6 negative uh, this year, whereas for the Euro era, uh, projecting negative 4.8 uh, for this year. Now, that's partly also for a couple other reasons. Uh, one is that they, they're not pursuing the kind of stimulus policy that even are in the United States. In the United States. Uh, as I mentioned, Mexico was negative 7.3. Uh, for this year, but, Latin, uh, but Brazil is only negative 1.3. Why? Brazil has you know, not even a third of the trade uh, with uh, overall in Mexico has, and uh, the trade with the United States is maybe not even 1% of GDP. So uh, again, the transmission mechanism is through the real economy, but it hurts nonetheless. It's, uh, you see declines. So that's, the, uh, that's one of the main impacts uh, on the developing world. Now, very interestingly, China will also slow, but it's only projected to slow from 9% last year to 7.5%. Even though they do have quite a bit of trade, as you know. Now, why is that? Well, China is not a, you know, it's a semi-planned economy. I mean, 20% of GDP, which is more than all the investment we have in the United States, is state-owned uh, state investment. Uh, the banking system is mostly state-owned. So when China wants to switch their priorities, as they did in the last crisis during the Asian crisis, they can switch a lot of their priorities, and uh, they can adapt much more uh, better to uh, this uh, to the loss of export markets than uh, other countries that are heavily uh, that are heavily dependent on trade. And they, they they do it so, and as a result, they're also roughly the second largest economy in the world. So they will have a major impact on the region. 
and, uh, and, and hopefully you're in Little Asia to recover uh, in spite of the U.S. not the U.S. lagging. The U.S., you know, again, I'm, I'm speaking mainly on developing countries, so I don't want to focus much on this, but because it does have a big impact, it is important. I think the, the United States is, um, is still in a lot of trouble. And, uh, you know, we have a little, on our website at CEQA, we have an honorable economist that have called for, the, uh, for a third stimulus, uh, because the last one was uh, quite inadequate. It really amounts to, uh, you know, not even 1% of GDP if you knock off the cuts in, in the state and local government uh, uh, spending and their tax increase. Uh, you've you got a very small uh, stimulus for 2009 and 2010. And uh, the last economist that we added to the list was, uh, to his credit, uh, Olivier Blanchard, the chief economist of the IMF, who announced this last week that uh, the country should be looking to, uh, to another stimulus. It's the rich countries, of course, and I'm going to get to that in a minute. So, uh, so because the United States is, is, you know, until the United States uh, adopts another stimulus and a large one, uh, we don't expect any sustained recovery. We could have a positive quarter, and, uh, you know, some uptick, but uh, not a sustained recovery for the United States. So far, President Obama is still against uh, another stimulus, but I suspect that he will change his mind as, as time goes on in the 2010 elections uh, get closer. So um, that's the, uh, you know, the, in terms of the uh, overview, uh, Africa has been hit very hard, mainly, again, uh, another transmission mechanism, which I haven't mentioned, is commodity prices. And unfortunately, those were affected very much by speculation, both on the upswing and on the downswing. Uh, they recovered a lot this year, so I think Africa will be better off for that. But their growth slowed from 6% uh, to 1.5% from 2008 to 2009, so they were very hard hit. Latin America is not projected to be hit, uh, well, they actually are projected to be hit fairly hard. Uh, but again, it really varies by country. Their projected growth is negative 2.6 for this year, but I have to also qualify that these are the IMF projections I'm using, and they've been wrong about Latin America many times uh, for many years, uh, and usually in that, uh, in that direction. Now what about the, what about, uh, the uh, developing countries? And, and I haven't even talked about the human cost. You know, there are various estimates uh, in terms of the increase in unemployment, the increase in poverty rates. It's in the tens of millions, maybe hundred of million, maybe over hundred million for poverty uh, in the world. Uh, and the um, and, and this is you know obviously a huge impact. And many people, including the, the uh, people at the UN uh, commission that Stiglitz headed, uh, President Lula da Silva of Brazil, have pointed out repeatedly that this is particularly unjust uh, because the developing countries were not the source of this crisis. It really is the epicenters in the United States and the other uh, rich countries. And so that's uh, very important to keep in mind. Now, the, uh, and I think it's, you know, the UN Council uh, has, uh, the Stiglitz Commission has made a, a, a very strong case uh, that the United Nations should be the, the center of reform efforts uh, for uh, the global economic system uh, going forward. But unfortunately for us, the power, uh, the financial cartel that Nancy described in her introduction still belongs to the U.S. Treasury Department and they don't intend uh, to give that up at all. In fact, we had a huge battle uh, in Congress. Has anybody talked about this already or should I give a couple of details? Details. Um, so we had a big ba battle in Congress uh, in the last month uh, to try and attach some reforms to the $108 billion that uh, Congress approved for the IMF. And we mostly uh, failed. There was some language that came out of the conference report that included uh, things that we wanted. Uh, and I'll get to that in a minute. But the point is, we were trying to attach some language that would prevent the IMF from uh, some of its worst abuses. 
And this has always been our strategy at CEPR for the last 10 years and beyond before that, before we formed the CEPR. Um, we call it harm reduction in, in dealing with these uh, powerful institutions. That is, you try to reduce the harm that they do, even though you're also trying to reform them and get them to do good things, you have to recognize that over the long term, the most powerful impact that, uh, that non governmental organizations can have, or I should say in the foreseeable future, not necessarily in the long term, uh, is to reduce the harm that they cause because they, have, they can do enormous damage. And uh, so our efforts were, uh, this was a harm reduction effort to attach conditions um, first of all, to say that they, they shouldn't, uh, they can't ask governments to cut health care and education spending, for example. To say that they can't um, uh, impose uh, contractionary or what comes called pro cyclical um, economic policies, macroeconomic policies, that is, uh, Cutting spending, raising taxes, raising interest rates, cutting the real money supply. But they shouldn't be able to be allowed to do that uh, in countries that had, say, less than two percent growth over the last year. And uh, and then some democracy reforms that their agreements have to be passed by uh, parliaments, which is also limited to some of the more recent agreements. And uh, in the bill that passed. Uh, well, it was an interesting battle because the Obama administration attached the spending to the war spending bill, the war supplemental, I should say, or the appropriations. And uh, they got it passed, uh, but it was a real fight. I mean, the people, the groups are working on it, and I have to give a lot of credit to a lot of groups, especially the peace organizations who were against the supplemental, uh, not only because of the IMF spending, but also because of the wars. Um, and they managed to get 32 Democrats to hold their ground. The Republicans voted against because they didn't want to get enough money on the, on the war spending bill. And, uh, and, uh, but it squeaked by with three votes, and the, uh, they got it. But it took a lot, of, it took a, quite a, a fight, and it shows that people can actually have some influence. And then I, in the report language, it did include some of the language. Uh, in the conference report, um, and then uh, President Obama uh, saw, issued a signing statement where he basically said that the administration was not bound by any of this uh, language. And uh, Congress rebelled, and they voted, what was the vote? Uh, 400 to uh, 3 to say that, uh, no, this language is our, our input, and, uh, and uh, you don't have the right to the executive branch to not have the right to, uh, to, to write, sign Congress out of the uh, picture. So there's still hope uh, for reform, I think, going forward to limiting them. It's going to be a long battle, uh, but uh, every a year at least, uh, we have a chance in Congress to limit them. And I think, you know, it's not as dismal as you might think. I mean, the reason they got this passed, they had to do quite a bit to get it passed. They had to attach it to the uh, supplemental appropriations bill and tell everybody that if you don't vote for this, you know, you're going to get baited as being against the troops. They had to pull out all the stops. They had to threaten many Democrats with many evil things. Um, they had to uh, do quite a bit. Um, and it's the hardest battle they had. And they got it also because Obama is still on a honeymoon, and uh, many Democrats who know exactly what the IMF does and are very uh, in favor of these reforms didn't uh, vote against it because they didn't want to go against Obama because he made a commitment to the G8 and all that stuff. So those were very uh, so again, uh, you can't uh, look at this and think that this battle is over at all. That's just a, a little over that but that struggle was continued. Now. What about the developing countries and the crisis in the IMF and macroeconomic policy? That's what I'll talk about until I uh, stop, which won't be very long. Um, and if, if you notice, I said that the IMF, including their chief economist, has now even come off, uh, the chief economist has come out for a third stimulus. The IMF has, from the beginning of this recession, which started in the United States in December of 2007, has, uh, has called for uh, big fiscal stimulus. And even uh, um, expansionary monetary policy as well. 
Uh, but the uh, call has been limited to the rich countries. So this is the double standard that I'm talking about. And this is the thing that, uh, the thing that we have to fix. Uh, because it is possible for developing countries also to pursue stimulus policy. And there are a whole number of countries in Latin America that are doing so. And you will see that they will come out of this crisis, for example, better than the others. And China is another example. They have one of the biggest stimulus uh, programs in the world. It's uh, much bigger than ours as a percentage of their economy. And uh, they also, uh, I think that's part of the reason they're, they're not uh, doing as badly as, as other countries. So why can't, uh, why does the IMF do this? Um, and, and what is their position? First, let's make their position clear because they do fudge that quite a bit. You know, we had a debate with them just recently where they tried to say, no, we're not doing this. Well, in the uh, agreements that they have, we're still going through all 50 of them, but the uh, overwhelming majority of them have some kind of pro-cyclical policy. That is, policy that uh, will make uh, the economy slow or worse, or it's in recession, make the recession worse. And that would include uh, reducing the fiscal deficit, uh, which could be either cutting spending or raising taxes. That would include raising interest rates. And that would include uh, shrinking the real money supply. And the countries that have, uh, you know, standby or other short-term arrangements that have this uh, include uh, El Salvador, Pakistan, Ukraine, Turkey, Latvia, Hungary, Belarus, Serbia, and Armenia. Uh, those are just the ones that uh, we looked at that have uh, these kinds of policies. But uh, in the poorer countries, it's about half of the uh, current agreements also have. Uh, uh, pro-cyclical uh, policies, and in many cases, I would say in, in, in almost all these cases, really, it's unnecessary. Now, what is the argument? The IMF has an argument. You know, their argument is that the rich countries can afford to have uh, stimulus policies because they either can borrow uh, domestically without causing too much inflation. Uh, or uh, they can uh, borrow internationally on the current account if they, um, and or I should say, they can borrow internationally. In the United States case, of course, the rest of the world is using the dollar, so we don't even uh, you know, have a problem in running a huge uh, current account deficit if we want to. Um, and, uh, but even in other, cur other countries that have hard currencies, the Euro, the Euro area, Japan, they also, um, can, uh, they don't have the problem that they're going to, uh, they could print money, mm -hmm. like we've done. The Fed has created over a trillion dollars in, in, in new money uh, since this recession began. So uh, what they're arguing is two things. One, that the developing countries have a constraint that the rich countries don't have. Namely, they have to have enough international reserves to be able to guarantee their banking system and to carry on a normal trade. And if they go below a certain amount, they have a crisis. Okay? Now, what does that have to do with stimulating the economy? Well, it so happens that if you stimulate your economy, uh, one of the things that happens is you grow faster than you otherwise would. And if you grow faster, you import more. And uh, so that uh, all of the things being equal will reduce your trade balance and your current account balance. And if you're running a current account deficit, as many of these countries are, that means that it gets worse, and you start to need a reserve. So that's their basic story. Uh, there are a couple other stories that go with it. I mean, in Eastern Europe, for instance, they'll argue that Latvia, uh, Estonia, Lithuania, uh, they have uh, currencies that are pegged to the euro, and uh, they don't want to undermine confidence in the peg. So those countries have to bear an even higher price. It's very similar to what they did in Argentina from now 1998 until the currency collapsed at the end of 2001. And they did a similar thing in Brazil and in Russia. And you can see historically that, that was completely wrong. In every one of these uh, countries, they went through recessions of some sort, some terrible, uh, like Argentina. The currency collapsed anyway, and then they began their recovery. Uh, so it was wrong, uh, but that is one thing that you can't do uh, as a matter of economics, matter of economics. If you have a current account deficit and you want to reduce it, one way you can reduce it is by shrinking the economy. 
And I should say we're doing that right now in the United States quite efficiently, uh, not deliberately. But the recession has brought our, our current account was over, uh, was around 7% of GDP at peak, and it's now down to 3.2 on a year over year basis, which is quite a big drop. Now, unfortunately for us, because of the structural uh, problems in our uh, trade deficit, it's going to shoot way back up. Uh, unless the dollar, unless we actually get the dollar down and keep it there, uh, it'll shoot way back up when the recovery starts. But nonetheless, you can see how this process works. So that's kind of the IMF story. Now, what's wrong with the story? Well, the biggest thing that's wrong with the story is that that's what they're supposed to be there for, is to provide the hard currency so that these countries can, most of them at least, do the same thing that we're doing, which is to stimulate their economy in a recession instead of shrinking. Okay? So that's the number one thing that's wrong with it. And I'll admit that there are borderline cases. There are cases where the current economy has gone so huge uh, that uh, the country can't do what we do. Uh, although, you know, it really depends. I mean, if the United States is willing to put up some serious money, they can do it. Uh, you know, look at Mexico, for example. The IMF has, has provided $48 billion in flexible, in their uh, FCL flexible uh, credit line. And the U.S. Federal Reserve has provided another $30 billion. That's a lot of credit. So Mexico, I think, doesn't really have to worry about a run on the peso. It doesn't have to worry about a, a banking system collapse that would be caused uh, by, uh, you know, the sudden uh, or too large a depletion of their reserves like we had in 1995. But, uh, uh, so if they want to put up the money, and unfortunately the flexible credit line uh, for the, from the IMF has only been available to Mexico, Colombia, and Poland. So you have to be a right-wing government with a very special relationship. The United States seems to be the only uh, requirement for the SEO. If they were to do that for other countries, and you have to remember also that a lot of countries look at the poorest countries in the world, what are they going to borrow from the U.S. to back the from the IMF, from the debt banking system? It would be very, very little. And so they could save a lot of countries. They could rescue a lot of countries instead of squeezing them. And that's what's uh, really wrong. And I don't have to, you know, I don't, I don't want to go into the whole history of what they've done, but they do have a 30-year history of, of doing this. Okay, I think I've covered the overview. Um, and uh, we have time for questions, so I can go into detail. The only last point I want to make is, is, is how important this IMF story is to the overall world economy. Because obviously, the countries that are independent of the IMF, like China or Vietnam or uh, India and uh, most of Latin America, uh, most of the middle income Asian, Asian countries, they're going to do what they want, and they're not going to be affected. But the problem is, that there are still 50 agreements out there in the world that the IMF has. Some of them will be renewed. And the IMF is getting an infusion of money that it's never had before in its entire existence, never come close to it's even relative to the world GDP. It's hundreds of billions of dollars. So uh, this is an attempt by the US Treasury Department and the European Union, which is their ally, uh, all these in Japan too, uh, to a lesser extent, but still less, enough so they're willing to kick in $100 billion, to revive this institution that had lost most of its influence in the world over the last decade. And that loss of its influence over the last decade, I think, in, in, in my opinion, is the uh, most important and positive uh, change in the international financial system that's taken place, uh, it's the most important change that's taken place since the collapse of the Bretton Woods system in 1973. So, they're trying a major reversal. And they won't get most of it. Like most of the middle income countries will never go to the IMF again, no matter what. But they will increase their power and influence. And since they haven't changed their economics, that's a bad thing. That's got to be a bad thing. So that's going to be a big struggle in the ensuing years. It's not anywhere near as bad as it looks if you just look at the dollar amount that they're getting. But it's still a very important, a very important problem going forward. Okay, I'll leave it there for, for a question. Thank you.